This channel is part of the History Hit Network. For hundreds of years, the two kingdoms of Scotland and England were at best uneasy neighbours and all too often enemies. Over the long centuries, countless battles were lost and won. But in the grim and bloody litany of glorious victory and bitter defeat, there is one name which resounds above all others, one battle which saw a proud Scottish king and nearly all his chief nobles, together with thousands of common pikemen, fall in bloody ruin. It was this tragic day in 1513 which inspired a haunting lament still played today over the graves of Scottish soldiers around the world. It tells the story of the death of a generation on the field of Flodden. King James IV of Scotland was in many ways a typical Renaissance prince. He was an unquestioned despot who ruled his country with a firm hand, especially the turbulent borderlands between Scotland and England. Yet he was also passionately interested in the arts, literature and science. Unfortunately, like many another of his contemporaries, he was also drawn to that most destructive of sciences, war. Regrettably for James, his love of war was also shared by his brother-in-law, King Henry VIII of England. Henry was one of the greatest and most powerful sovereigns his country would ever produce. He was strong, foresighted and crafty. He was also headstrong and had many faults, but he was nobody's fool. Henry and James were related by the marriage of James to Henry's sister, Margaret. This marriage had been intended to bring peace between Scotland and England. But the marriage and the blood ties it created counted for little in the face of the iron will of Henry of England and the hopelessly romantic James of Scotland. At the end of the 15th century, France had invaded Italy, beginning a series of destructive wars and effectively gaining dominance in southern Europe. To attempt to redress the balance, the Holy League had been created. This was essentially an anti-French alliance which included Venice, Spain, the Papal States and the Holy Roman Empire. In 1511, King Henry, eager for military glory, joined the Holy League. The sworn object of the League was to prevent France from dominating Europe. And faced with the addition of yet another powerful opponent in the form of England, the French King, Louis XII, looked around for some allies of his own he did not have to look far. For centuries, Scotland and England had been at each other's throats. Many times before, in an effort to offset her weakness in terms of manpower, Scotland had allied herself with France. In 1512, Louis and James once again renewed the Auld Alliance between Scotland and France, by which each country pledged to assist the other in case of an English attack. On the face of it, Scotland had little to gain from such an alliance at this particular time. However, King James was a romantic soul, and even then his military ambitions centred around the chivalric vision of a grand crusade against the Turks, which would recapture the spirit of great crusades of earlier centuries. Despite the outmoded nature of James's goal, Louis cynically encouraged the Scots king with promises of support for this crusade once the present crisis was over. In actual fact, a desperate effort to counterbalance the increased military might of the Holy League by Louis would soon be forced to form an alliance with those very Turks whom James hoped to conquer. 
as a result of their new political alliance, Scotland would immediately be drawn into any war between France and England. And war with France was exactly what King Henry of England now had in mind. History hit is like Netflix, just for history fans. With exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history, just for you. With familiar faces such as Dan Jones and Dr. Eleanor Yanega, we've got hundreds of documentaries covering the greatest figures and events of medieval history. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and Chronicle fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code CHRONICLE at checkout. Despite any private reservations, the French king may have harboured about James's grand crusading plans, in public he was quick to keep his pledge to support James. The ink on the new treaty was barely dry when French ships began arriving in Scottish ports carrying armour, lands connect pikes, gunpowder and other warlike provisions. Not for the crusade of course, but to strengthen the Scots army for the coming war with England. By the beginning of 1513, Scotland and England were firmly locked into what could be fairly described as an arms race. There were occasional clashes at sea, but otherwise the two countries remained uneasily at peace. With his back as secure as it was ever likely to be, the warlike Henry of England eagerly wished to join with his continental allies in pursuing a war with Louis. He therefore began mobilising his army for a campaign in France. Faced by this threat, King Louis of France mobilised his own army and now called upon his new ally, King James of Scotland, to fulfil his treaty obligations. By dragging Scotland into the war, Louis hoped to open a second front against Henry, thus dragging English troops away from France. Like the great statesman he was, Henry had laid plans for just such an eventuality. Despite having his eyes set firmly on France, Henry was always conscious of the threat from the north. He distrusted the Scots absolutely. He was well aware of what one chronicler called the old pranks of the Scots which is ever to invade England when the king is out. He had therefore raised not one, but two English armies. One army, drawn principally from the south of England, would campaign with him in France against Louis. Before setting sail for France on the 30th of June 1513, Henry instructed the aged Earl of Surrey to organise this second army in the north of England. He left Surrey with the words, My lord, I trust not the Scots, therefore I pray you not to be negligent of them. By the overt act of war against France, Henry had forced James's hand. To fulfil the objects of the treaty, King James ordered a full mobilisation of his forces. At the same time, he formally notified King Henry that he would invade England unless the siege of Therouan in northern France was lifted. Henry flew into an English rage at this bold request, but once he had calmed down, he refused to be intimidated. In fact, he probably relished the challenge. With the Scots' mobilisation scheduled to be complete by the 13th of August, the Earl of Surrey was ordered to prepare in his turn for full mobilisation of the English Northern Army. Despite James's wholehearted commitment to the war with England, the mood in Scotland was less enthusiastic. And there was a strong possibility that the pleas of his nobles might dissuade James from taking up his obligations under the treaty with France. James, however, had a strong sense of duty and a highly developed personal code of honour which he modelled upon his own vision of knightly values. Added to this, a romantic sense of chivalry was a weakness for the ladies which was to be ruthlessly exploited by Louis. Sensing that there was a strong movement in Scotland against war with England, Louis allowed the Queen of France to write a personal letter to James in which she begged him as her knight to protect her from the unwanted attentions of King Henry. 
With her artful letter, she enclosed a turquoise ring and, rather more pointedly, sent 14,000 crowns to affray James's costs. James now saw himself as the champion of a fine queen in distress. Never one to withstand an appeal to his chivalry, James would listen to no man. He committed his country to war against England. The disaster of Flodden was now only weeks away. With the king away and the full might of Scotland ranged against him, the Earl of Surrey had quite a task on his hands. And it is a measure of his ability that the king felt able to entrust the safety of the realm to a man who had fought valiantly against his own father, Henry Tudor, at Bosworth Field in 1485, where Henry had won the crown of England to become Henry VII. Despite his previous allegiance, Surrey had gone on to serve Henry VII well as Lord Lieutenant of the North, and when King James of Scotland laid siege to Norham Castle in northern England during 1497, it was Surrey who had successfully marched to its relief. It was only natural, therefore, that he should now be called upon to face James again. The English army which Surrey led at Flodden was made up of a mixture of professional soldiers and militia. It was not a particularly modern army, and apart from its train of artillery, it was very little changed from the armies which had performed so gloriously at Agincourt and Cressy. Like those earlier armies, Surrey's force contained very few cavalrymen. During the Hundred Years' War with France, the English men-at-arms, armoured knights and called sergeants had become accustomed to fighting on foot. At the heart of the army was the Earl of Surrey's personal retinue of some 500 men, chiefly drawn from his East Anglian estates. Only 43 of this total were cavalrymen, and only a single man named Avery of Berwick wore full armour. It was probably he who carried the royal standard. The greater part of Surrey's men were foot soldiers, making up the equivalent of a single infantry battalion, exactly 446 men and 10 officers armed either with longbows or the formidable brown bill, a vicious cross between a spear and a battle axe. As these men were to be on royal service, many of them were given a coat in the Tudor livery, colours of white and green. It was meticulously recorded that these cost four shillings each. In addition to his own men, Surrey was also responsible for assembling the army's general staff and the artillery, led by the Master of the Ordnance, Sir Nicholas Appleyard. This comprised another 400 gunners, drivers, grooms and craftsmen, looking after five brass field guns called serpentines. These monstrous guns fired a four or five pound ball. They were backed by no fewer than 18 falcons, much lighter pieces which fired a two-pound ball and gave murderous support to the infantry. Ironically, artillery was also the great love of the Scottish King James, and he lavished great care and attention on his artillery park, spending a huge proportion of the national wealth on his favourite toy. Despite her relative poverty, by 1513, Scotland possessed an artillery train second to none. But it was to be the English guns of the Earl of Surrey which would have the final say at Flodden. On the 21st of July, 1513, the Earl of Surrey mustered his little army at Lambeth in London and next day headed north to begin the campaign of Flodden. He reached Doncaster by the 1st of August, and from there he sent out letters to the sheriffs of the northern counties, warning them to hold their men in readiness. In the meantime, Sir William Bulmer was ordered to patrol the border with a force of mounted archers. After that, hampered by a shortage of ready money, Surrey waited at Pontefract Castle for firm news of the Scots' intentions. That news was brought by Lord Dacre, the English Warden of the West Marsh. 
On the 13th of August, Lord Hume, the warden of the Scottish East March, had launched a destructive raid into Northumberland, burning seven villages and driving off a large herd of cattle and horses. The raiders were estimated to be as many as 3,000 strong. But Sir William Bulmer has successfully ambushed Hume and his raiders at a place called Millfield near Wooler in the north of England. The Scots were routed and in the process Hume lost a considerable number of men as well as his personal banner and all of his ill-gotten plunder. Just as embarrassing was the fact that a couple of his relatives were amongst the prisoners held by the Empire. Some of those prisoners admitted to Dacre that King James definitely intended to invade England and had assembled no less than 100,000 men for the purpose. Nevertheless, the prisoners could provide no firm word of where or when the expected invasion would come. It was even possible that a series of heavy raids was intended rather than a full-scale invasion, but they could not tell for sure. So while Lord Hume's relatives moulded in prison, Surrey waited and watched. The wily old Surrey delayed mustering his full army until he was sure the Scots army had indeed crossed the border. In those days the business of feeding an army in the field was a Herculean task, given the primitive supply systems of the day, and bringing together a large force was not something that an experienced commander undertook lightly. Surrey's wisdom was to serve him well. Hard-riding messengers brought the news to York on the 25th of August that the Scots had not crossed the border until the 22nd of August. Only then did Surrey order a full mobilisation. For all armies of this period, desertion was an extensive problem. And in addition, once an army was brought together, the men began to die in large numbers, almost immediately from either malnourishment or the diseases which resulted from the unhygienic camp practices of the day. Smallpox and typhus were particularly virulent killers, and any army assembled in the field quickly began to disappear before the eyes of its frustrated commanders. By delaying his major muster, Surrey avoided these dangers. Surrey expected the Scots to proceed to lay siege to Berwick-upon-Tweed, as was their usual custom in conflicts between their countries. But he was to be deceived. Instead, they attacked the English border stronghold of Norham Castle. The governor confidently announced that he would hold out long enough for King Henry to return from France if necessary, but Surrey was taking no chances. On the 26th of August, he left York and headed north, gathering troops on the way. By the 30th of August, Surrey was at Durham, where he collected the contingents from the bishopric and the great banner of St Cuthbert, a potent rallying symbol for the English northerners. Two days later, Surrey was in Newcastle upon Tyne. Lord Dacre, with a large number of English borderers, joined him there, but Surrey also heard the disconcerting news that Norham Castle had fallen after a siege of just five days. The border was wide open, and there was no time to lose. Surrey next moved northwards to Annick. On the 4th of September, he was joined there by his eldest son, the Lord Admiral of England with 1,210 professional soldiers who had been serving as marines. Their officers were to be invaluable to Surrey, as were a dozen experienced German gunners who accompanied them. Most of the day of August the 30th was taken up with a planning conference. As the English army was predominantly composed of militiamen, they would soon be clamouring to go home, so there was little time to lose. In any case, both the militia and the regulars were a considerable drain on Surrey's meagre coffers, so it obviously made sense to seek battle as soon as possible. The question was how to do it, for against all expectation the Scots had not advanced southwards. Indeed, they had barely even crossed the border. Throughout Scotland, the mood was less than confident 
and a number of seemingly supernatural portents were observed, the most famous of which was described by a Scots chronicler named Pitt Scotty. The king came to Linlithgow, very sad and dolorous, making his devotion to God to send him good chance and fortune in his voyage. And there came a man of fifty years, clad in a blue gown, crying and asking for the king, saying that he desired it to speak with him, till at the last he came to the desk before him and said to him in this manner, Sir King, my mother has sent me to thee, desiring thee not to go where thou art purposed, for if thou do, Thou shalt not fare well in thy journey, nor none that are with thee. Further she bade thee converse with no woman, nor use their counsel. For if thou do it, thou wilt be confounded and brought to shame. By the time this man had spoken these words to the king, the even song was near done. And the king paused it on these words, studying to give him an answer. But in the meantime, before the king's face, and in the presence of all the lords that were about him at that time, this man vanished away, as if he'd been one blink of the sun, and could no more be seen. It is perhaps doubtful whether this apparition was as supernatural as Pitt Scotty believed. It may even have been a well-managed publicity stunt arranged by the Queen. The pointed reference to the cause of a woman would certainly support that view. It did not sway James, but it certainly must have added to the unsettling tide of omens against the venture. Still, in desperation, the peace party argued Scotland's treaty obligations to France could be fulfilled by border incursions, such as Hume's ill-fated raid, which had seen his relatives captured. However, the king would have none of it, and Bulmer's victory over Hume at Millfield merely added another slight to the king's overdeveloped sense of honour. A full-scale invasion it had to be, and that required a full mobilisation of Scotland's army. Since the time of Bannockburn 200 years before, the barons, the freeholders and the citizens of royal boroughs were obliged to muster themselves and their tenants in their best array for 40 days military service on receipt of a writ from the king. This writ was now duly issued. The barons and freeholders were also obliged to arm and equip their men and to provide for their upkeep during those 40 days. At the end of that period, the king had either to release them and allow them to return home, or else feed and pay for them himself. This system worked well enough for the defence of the kingdom, where those raised were known as fencibles, that is, men capable of bearing arms defensible. For the defence of the realm, the system was fine, but worked less well beyond a strictly local level. One of the reasons for this was the large distances involved meant that those contingents coming from the highlands and the far north of Scotland had made substantial inroads into their supplies before they even reached the rendezvous at Edinburgh on the 13th of August. Even more importantly, the time spent in marching could not be spent in training for the coming campaign. Even those levies raised nearer to Edinburgh quite understandably delayed their mustering in order not to waste supplies. But of course, having done so, they too found themselves short of time in which to train in the new tactics. A good many of those who did assemble on Edinburgh's Borough Muir were no doubt hardened fighters, even professional soldiers, who were veterans of many a skirmish where individual battle skills counted for everything. Now, however, both they and the raw ploughboys and weavers filling out the ranks had to learn to work together, manoeuvring and fighting in large, tightly packed masses. But they were to have precious little time in which to do it. 
The army assembled on the Borough Muir was said to be the largest ever assembled in Scotland. Some contemporaries have calculated it as 60,000 strong. A huge host to be assembled for a poor, backward country like Scotland. By the time the two armies eventually met on Flodden Field, they had been reduced by sickness and desertion to not much more than 20,000 men apiece. But while there was little enough between them in terms of numbers, they were two very different armies. The English army, apart from its up-to-date artillery, was still a medieval one, largely made up of billmen and bowmen. But the Scots army was intended to be a very modern Renaissance army. Although the mustering process was unchanged from the days of Bruce and Wallace, the equipment and tactics reflected the very best of current continental practice. In the 14th century, the Swiss infantry, like the Scots, had successfully held their own against the armoured knights who usually dominated medieval battlefields. Unlike the Scots, however, they had then gone on to exploit their central European position by hiring themselves out to the great powers of the day. Swiss pikemen rapidly earned a savage reputation throughout Europe as doughty and indeed well-nigh unbeatable soldiers. In the meantime, they spawned their imitators, most notably the famous German Landsknechts, mercenaries who fought for the highest bidder. They too fought with long pikes, and one of the ominous signs of Scotland's preparations for war had been the importation of thousands of Landsknecht pikes. At Antwerp, Imperial customs officials gloomily reported the large number of pikes bound for Scotland, but as the Emperor was not at war with the Scots, they could do nothing to intercept them. With the pikes came 40 experienced officers under a French captain named Dossy. Although these officers are usually described as being Frenchmen, they must actually have been Germans, for their task was to train the Scots levies in the new Landsknecht tactics. James probably believed that it would be an easy task, for the pike was a traditional weapon in Scotland. It turned out to be a fatal miscalculation. The old Scots Skiltron was little more than a solid mass of men armed with spears. Originally, it had been a defensive formation, ideally suited for fighting against cavalry. At Falkirk, however, Wallace's four great Skiltrons had been shot to bloody ribbons by King Edward's longbowmen. Bruce, on the other hand, recognised the spear or pike's potential as an offensive weapon, and at Bannockburn formed his skiltrons, or moving thickets of pikes, into attack columns. This demanded considerably more expertise than simply standing fast in a defensive ring. But Bruce, crucially, had the time to train his men. Indeed, as he waited outside Stirling in the summer of 1314, he rehearsed some of the moves his army was to make in the battle. The result, of course, was a resounding victory at Bannockburn, which secured Scotland's independence for hundreds of years to come. Unfortunately, those Scots armies which later attempted to repeat the success almost invariably came to grief, because they had not had the intensive training which Bruce gave his men nor an answer to the deadly firepower of the longbar, or latterly the arquebusier, an earlier form of musket. King James thought the answer was to adopt Landesknecht tactics, but in fact this decision merely compounded the problem. Instead of fighting in the huge unwieldy bodies of men characteristic of medieval warfare, the Landsknechts formed smaller, more manoeuvrable units. These were then able to deliver fast-moving assaults, preceded by skirmishers armed with arquebuses. The effectiveness of these tactics, however, depended very heavily upon the training and expertise of the troops involved. The lands connects were above all professional soldiers and therefore well able to reach the required standard of proficiency. The Scots army, however, was effectively a conscript militia 
and with only a matter of days at best in which to learn the necessary drills, it was perhaps inevitable that things would go wrong. The French commander, Odossi, and his Lance Connect captains will have been only too well aware of this, and it is likely that the apparent inaction which followed the capture of Norham Castle was a result of training in the works of the Scots army. At any rate, after the surrender of Norham on the 29th of August, the Scots made a leisurely advance southwards. The castles of Ford, Etal and Chillingham were quickly battered into submission, and then James established his army in an entrenched camp on Flodden Edge. The king was afterwards criticised by many chroniclers for apparently dallying with the Lady Heron at Ford Castle instead of striking southwards. James certainly had a reputation as a ladies' man, but the key to the question actually lies in the presence of the Lands Connect captains. The establishment of fortified camps was unprecedented in Scottish military history, but it was a well-tried Lands Connect practice. Secure in their mile-long position, the Lands Connects worked hard at preparing the raw Scots pikemen for the battle to come. There is perhaps no reason to doubt that King James, a notorious womaniser, was amorously engaged with Lady Heron, notwithstanding the dire warning of that mysterious man in blue who had appeared at Linlithgow. However, while he was thus amusing himself, the professionals were slowly licking his army into shape. The question was whether the professionals would have enough time, for Surrey needed to fight as soon as possible, and he was not about to let the opposing army slip away. On the 5th of September, Surrey sent Rouge Croix, herald to the Scots King. James, he declared, had entered England and slain English subjects without justice or reason, and he was therefore challenged to try the decision of right by force of arms before Friday next, the 9th of September. Rouge Croix was, of course, expected to take a good look at the Scots army while he was delivering the message and waiting for any reply. Such genteel spying was an accepted aspect of the Herald's role, providing it was not too blatant. And Surrey anticipated a return visit in due course from one of the Scots Heralds. What he did not anticipate was that James would detain Rouge Croix to prevent Surrey from obtaining that vital information until it was too late. Instead, the Scottish Isla Herald turned up in Surrey's camp with a formal acceptance of the challenge, was detained in his turn and then exchanged for Rouge Croix. Only when the English Herald returned did Surrey realise that he had committed himself to battle with a foe who was posted in a near impregnable position. An immediate demand that the Scots should descend and meet the English on the open plain of Millfield was treated with contempt, and Surrey therefore found himself in an awkward position. The English army was already running very short of provisions. They'd even run out of beer, and in a few days they would have to disband for want of food. Surrey needed to fight while he still had an army but attempting to storm a fortified hilltop position was out of the question. He had counted on meeting the Scots in the open field, not 500 feet up on Flodden Edge. The only conceivable approach was from the southeast, along the flat ground between the foot of Flodden Hill and the River Till, a narrow and dangerous defile, sure to be swept by the Scottish artillery. The situation was gloomily described by one of the Northumbrians serving under Lord Dacre. My Lord Surrey removed six miles to a field called Wooler Hall, within three miles of the King of Scots, where, as every man might see, the said King of Scots did lie with his army upon an high hill in the edge of Cheviot, within two miles of Scotland, enclosed on three sides by three great mountains, so there was no entry or passage unto him, but one way, where was laid marvellous and great ordnance of guns. Seeing that the King of Scots continued in the mountains, he sent unto him Rouge Cross, pursuivant of arms, and required that he came down 
into the plain of Millfield, where there was convenient ground for the coming together of two armies, or to a ground nearby called Flodden. At this, the king waxed angry with my lord, and would not speak with Rouge Cross, but had his message by report, and sent reply by a gentleman in these terms. The king, my master, wills that ye show to the Earl of Surrey that it beseemeth him not, being an earl, so largely to attempt a great prince. His grace will take and hold his ground and field at his own pleasure, and not at the assigning of the Earl of Surrey. Unwilling to admit defeat without a blow having been struck, Surrey now resolved to try and manoeuvre the Scots out of their position. In so doing, he was running a terrible risk. His plan was to march around the eastern flank of the Scots' position and take up a position between Flodden Edge and the Scottish border. If his communications with Scotland were thus cut, the king might then be compelled to come down and give battle. However, such a flank march in the presence of a watchful enemy might easily come to grief, and if the expected battle went badly, the remains of Surrey's army would be trapped between the victorious Scots and the River Tweed. Nevertheless, Surrey considered that he had no choice, and on the 8th he moved his hungry army from Wooler to Barmore Wood, facing the east end of the Scottish position. It was a short march of only two miles, but it brought his army into its jumping-off point. My Lord Surrey marched the 8th day of September, being War Lady's Day, the Nativity, and passed over the waters of Till, and lodged that night under a woodside called Barnmore Wood, directly against the King and his army, albeit there was a hill between the two hosts for avoiding the danger of gunshot, and notwithstanding, that for four or five days before there had been little or no wine, ale, nor beer for the people to refresh themselves with, and the whole army, for the most part, was enforced and constrained to drink water for the same time and season, with no comfort or trust of relief in that behalf. My Earl of Surrey and the army, the danger and the want of drink notwithstanding, courageously advanced forward get between the King of Scots and his realm of Scotland. That night, Surrey issued his final orders. The vanguard and the artillery, led by his son the Lord Admiral, was to move northwards and cross the River Till by Twizzle Bridge, while Surrey himself led the remainder over the river by a ford at Milford. Next morning, Having eaten the last of their rations, they set off at five o'clock. The northward move appears to have taken the Scots by surprise. The border reavers, who were acting as scouts, were off raiding villages to the south, and suddenly, at this critical point, King James and his officers were blind. What was Surrey up to? One possibility was that he was simply moving towards Berwick, in order to obtain supplies and establish a shorter line of communications. More worryingly, however, he might just as easily be intent on invading Scotland. This, however, could be discounted. The Scots were well aware of the parlous state of Surrey's forces. The Northwoods move must still therefore be aimed at bringing about a battle on the 9th. But instead of launching a suicidal frontal assault, he was intending to attack the Scots' position from behind. This assessment was agreed by one Giles Musgrave, an English outlaw acting as a guide for King James. He pointed out that Surrey was almost certainly intending to seize Braxton Hill, the more northerly of the three protecting James's position. It was separated from Flodden Hill only by a slight dip, so that if Surrey did succeed in planting his army upon it, he would nullify the Scots' advantage. Indeed, he might even stand on the defensive, forcing the Scots to attack him in order to clear their line of communications. James acted decisively. 
If this was indeed what Surrey intended, he still had several hours in which to act. Ordering his men to set fire to all the straw and litter in the great camp, he set his army in motion under cover of the resulting smoke screen. The Flodden position was abandoned, and instead the Scots moved a short distance to the northwest to take up a fresh position on Braxton Hill, thus denying it to the enemy, just at the moment when the Admiral's division was struggling to deploy across the Broxburn, a swampy stream. It was not too difficult for his infantry to wade through the morass, but the Admiral had all of the English guns in his charge, and these could only be brought across the narrow causeway known as Branks Bridge. The unexpected appearance of the Scots on the hill above him came as a shock. His father, with the main body, was still some distance to the east, coming over the till at Sandyford. It was now about four o'clock in the afternoon, and defeat was staring the English in the face. Tearing an Agnus Dei medal from his chest, he sent an urgent message to his father, imploring him to make haste. King James determined to seize his opportunity. The Admiral's division was hastily deployed into line of battle, but it was outflanked and separated from the rest of the English army. As a result, it was dangerously exposed, and James saw that he had an opportunity to defeat the English in detail. Any thought of fighting a defensive battle was rejected in favour of hasty, downhill assault. The deployment of the Scots army at Flodden reflected the teaching of the Lansconnect captains. In place of the three traditional huge divisions of medieval warfare, the vanward or advanced guard, the main battle and the rear ward, each drawing up in line from the right, King James's army was organised in five smaller divisions. Each of these divisions was in turn made up of two or more brigades of pikemen. If Lands Connect practice was being followed, each of these brigades would be preceded by a line of skirmishers, the Verlan Hope, or Forlorn Hope. Most of these skirmishers seem to have been armed with arquebuses, but some may have been Highland archers. On the left of the army, and facing the Admiral, was a division commanded by the Earls of Hume and Huntley. Some of the men in Huntley's brigade may have been Highlanders, but like Hume, he also held large estates in the borders, and most of his contingent came from Berwickshire. The next division comprised brigades led by the Earl of Errol, Constable of Scotland, and the Earls of Crawford and Montrose. The men of this division had been raised in the northeast of Scotland and the other lowland shires north of the Firth of Forth. In the centre stood the largest division, commanded by the King himself. This naturally included his own personal retinue and the usual cloud of aristocratic hangers-on who can be relied upon to congregate around the throne. But the bulk of the men in this division were raised in the west of Scotland by the Earls of Glencairn and Cassillis, and the Lords Herries and Maxwell. A short distance to the rear of this division was a brigade of Lothian levies, led by the Earl of Bothwell, and on their right flank stood a division of Highlanders, led by the Earls of Lennox and Argyll. There had been a considerable amount of desertion since the army left Edinburgh, and each of the four main divisions probably mustered no more than 5,000 men while Bothwell had half that number, making a grand total of about 22,000 men in the Scots army. This was about the same size as Surrey's force. The Scottish advance was made in Echelon, with the left-hand division leading. A sudden shower of rain had made the grass slope slippery, and many of the Scots pikemen took off their boots in an effort to maintain some sort of grip. All, however, came down the hill in the Almain, or German fashion, that is, without shouting or noise. The borderers made good speed, and long before the other divisions came into contact, they crashed into the Admiral's right wing. On the Admiral's right was a brigade of about 3,000 men commanded by his brother, Edmund Howard. Half of them came from Cheshire and Lancashire, while the rest were a fairly mixed bag of Marines and a small contingent from South Yorkshire. 
In the centre, commanded by the Admiral himself, stood some 9,000 men. Some were Marines clad in the royal livery of green and white, but the greater part of them came from Northumberland, Durham and North Yorkshire. On his left was a very much smaller brigade, commanded by the 70-year-old Sir Marmaduke Constable. This comprised 1,000 levies from Lancashire and an equal number from Northumberland and Yorkshire, as the Scots came down the hill towards them. Most of Edmund Howard's brigade broke and fled. It was said that the Cheshire men resented being placed under the command of a Howard instead of one of their beloved Stanleys. But whatever the reason, their desertion left the rest of the brigade horribly exposed. Elated, the two Scots brigade commanded by Hume and Huntley rolled over them. English casualties were heavy and Edmund Howard himself came close to being captured. And so it was that the Scots fiercely did set about Mr Edmund Howard, captain of the uppermost part of the field on the western side. And between them was so cruel a battle that many of our men of Cheshire and others did flee. So in manner, Master Edmund was left alone and without succour, and his standard and the bearer of the same beaten and hewn in pieces, and he himself right strapped into the ground. <laughs> Howbeit, like a courageous and hardy, lusty young gentleman, he recovered again and fought hand to hand with one Sir Davy Hume and slew him with his own hand. Thus, Master Edmund was in great peril and danger until the Lord Dacre, like a good and trusty knight, came to his relief and gave succour unto him. To add to the initial Scots success, the Admiral was now being menaced by a second Scots division, that led by the Earl of Errol. Assailed in front and flank at the same time, the Admiral's defeat would have been certain. But in fact, Hume and Huntley failed to exploit their victory. After the victory on the right, it took some time to reorganise their victorious forces before they could move against the English centre. It is in this area that discipline, training and good officers count for everything. Yet this was exactly what the Scots lacked. Eventually, they were pulled back into some sort of order and Huntley proposed that they should then fall upon the exposed flank of the Admiral's main battle. But by that time, Surrey had sent Lord Dacre's English borderers to his son's assistance and Hume insisted on facing them instead. This delay and subsequent inactivity proved fatal to the Earl of Errol and his division. With only 5,000 men, it was outnumbered almost two to one by the 9,000 men of the Admiral's main battle. And a counter-attack by Sir Marmaduke Constable's brigade completed Errol's discomfiture. With all their leaders slain, the Scots of Errol's division retreated back up the hill to rejoin those under Hume and Huntley. Effectively, there was not one, but two battles being fought out on the slopes below Brankston Hill that evening. The Admiral had decisively won his battle, and it now remained to be seen how his father would fare against the King. At the outset of the battle, the King's beloved artillery, commanded by Robin Borthwick, had been quite effective. When Dacre was ordered to go to the Admiral's assistance, Borthwick laid down a barrage which routed the levies from Tyndale and Bamburghshire before Nicholas Appleyard managed to bring the English guns into action. Some of Appleyard's guns were tasked with counter-battery fire, while the others successfully engaged the King's division which was still making its way down the hill towards Surrey's men. The crisis of the battle was approaching. King James dismounted from his horse and snatching up a pike placed himself in the front rank of his division. It was quite traditional for pikemen to be led on by their officers but James was no lands connect captain. He was a king and more importantly a commander in chief his place was in the saddle directing the battle. 
However inspiring his action, by placing himself in the front rank, he relinquished all control over his mighty army and arguably threw away any chance of winning the battle. It may simply have been one of those impetuous decisions for which he was notorious. But it is more likely that James never had any intention of directing the struggle once battle was joined. Both armies were more or less equal in numbers and it was to be a straightforward fight to the death. Death came quickly to many in the King's division. As they came down the slope, the rest of Nicholas Appleyard's gunners switched from counter-battery fire to the altogether much more tempting target presented by the massed ranks of Scott's pikemen. They could hardly miss. It was just as well for Surrey that his guns were so effective, for the vaunted English longbowmen were for once ineffective. The men in the front ranks of the Scottish formations were well armoured, and as one chronicler remarked, they were most assuredly harnessed and abode the most dangerous shot of arrows which sore annoyed them, yet except it hit them in some bare place, did them no hurt. Furthermore, many of the archers found their bowstrings had become damp and their bows were therefore less effective. Yet the same showers which wet the bowstrings also proved the Scots' undoing. Lance-connect tactics were brutally direct. Once they were committed to action, the front ranks levelled their pikes shoulder high and moved forward as fast as the ground would allow. It was rare for their pike heads to actually penetrate the armour and thick protective clothing worn by the opposing infantry. But what they aimed to do was, quite literally, knock them over by sheer impetus. Once the enemy were down, pikes would be discarded and swords used to finish off the now helpless men as they struggled to rise and flee. To do this, however, required a firm grip underfoot, speed and perfect discipline. All three were lacking at Flodden. In the first place, even though many Scots had taken their boots off, the wet grass made the steep slope treacherously slippery. And then a slight boggy dip immediately in front of Surrey's position combined with this to prevent the Scots coming forward at the steady trot favoured by the lands connects. A lack of discipline and the effects of Appleyard's artillery fire also tended to break up the Scots' formations, lessening the eventual impact still further. Consequently, when the King's division actually came into collision with Surrey's stationary men, the English kept their footing and held their ground. The long pikes were now useless, and the Scots quickly discarded them and took to their swords, but they were at a terrible disadvantage against the English bills. Then Bothwell brought his reserve brigade down the hill and into the melee, seemingly without affecting the outcome. It seems he may simply have fed his men into the already stationary mass. Nevertheless, a brutal fight ensued, in which neither side gave nor asked for quarter. The Scots leaders were so well armoured that not only were they virtually impervious to arrows, but they were such large and stout men that one witness commented they did not fall even when struck by four or five bills. Unlike Bothwell's ineffectual intervention in the centre, the English Admiral's action was to prove decisive. Having reorganised his division after their victory over Errol's men, he turned and crashed into the flank and rear of the King's division. The arrival of this new force seems to have decided the issue in the centre, and Scott's resistance collapsed. Most of the lightly equipped soldiers in the rear of the columns probably made their way back up the hill without too much difficulty. But there was no escape for the heavily armoured leaders in the front ranks. Amongst those who died was King James himself. Trying to cut his way through to meet Surrey, he had his helmet beaten off 
was wounded in the face by an arrow and finally hacked to death by an unknown builder. A less than chivalrous end for a king who would only expect to be dispatched by an equal. But in the heat of the fury, few could yet know the fate of the king. Up on Brankston Hill, one last Scots division remained to be committed. The Highlanders, led by Lennox and Argyle. For some reason, they had remained on the hill throughout the battle. James may have neglected to give them any orders, or more probably perhaps because they had little armour and no pikes, he all along intended them to remain in reserve. At any rate, seeing the King's division in trouble, they had just started to move down the slope in order to cover its retreat when they were hit in the flank by an English brigade led by Sir Edward Stanley. Scrambling up the side of the hill unseen, Stanley's archers poured a hasty volley into the unsuspecting Highlanders. The result was devastating. Lennox and Argyle were both killed. The Highlanders made a half-hearted attempt to counter-attack, but were then driven pell-mell down the hill and across the ground where the King's division had just been beaten. Surrey's men were in no condition to intercept them, however, and the survivors got clean away when their pursuers fell to plundering the dead. Night was falling by now, and both armies wearily withdrew to their original positions. Surrey, falling back on Barmore, knew that he had won the battle, and may even have known that the King of the Scots was dead. But neither he nor his army were in any condition to finish the job by taking on Hume and Huntley's unbeaten brigades. Surrey's victory had been dearly bought, and if his payrolls are reliable, some 1,500 of his men died at Flodden, besides as many more who had run away when the right wing collapsed. Furthermore, the survivors who had marched all day and fought well into the night were still desperately short of supplies, and when they reached Barmore village, they were disgusted to find their own camp plundered by those men who had earlier run away. Up on Brangston Hill, surrounded by the dead and wounded, Hume and Huntley spent a still more sombre night. Although they had won their own fight and held their brigades together, it was obvious that disaster had overwhelmed the rest of the army. As the shocked survivors assembled in the darkness, the full extent of that disaster gradually became apparent. In the thin light of dawn, the Scots came down off the hill once more, but this time, abandoning their camp and most of their artillery, they retreated northwards, back across the Tweed and into Scotland. Behind them, they left upwards of 3,000 dead, including their king, eight earls, and 13 barons. Nearly every nobleman who had followed him down that fatal slope. A whole generation of the country's leaders had been wiped out. There was scarce a family in Scotland not touched by the tragedy. One man had seven sons slain at Flodden. As they awaited news in Edinburgh, a terrible wailing rose from the streets as the women's folk looked for a sign of departed sons and husbands. So terrible were their cries that a proclamation was passed which read, All women are to pass to their labours and not be seen upon the gate clamouring and crying under pain of banishment from the city. In her palace at Linlithgow, Queen Margaret and her infant son waited for news in the high tower which to this day has been known as Queen Margaret's Tower. Eventually, a worn-out messenger arrived in Edinburgh, nearly dead with fatigue. He carried the terrible news. The king is slain, and with him, the flower of Scotland.